Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat Purnamudachate, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishyate, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste. So the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad begins with a meditation on the sacrificial horse of the Ashvamedha Jagnya. So this requires some background, and it's not given in the Upanishad itself or in the commentary. I mean, only a sketchy background. So I thought I would begin the series with a backgrounder giving the context of the Ashvamedha Jagnya. And then the whole meditation will make that much more sense to the viewers, I hope. <laughs> I found some really interesting things about it. Well, let me read from the document that I compiled from various sources about the Ashvamedha. Historical background. The Ashvamedha is rooted in the Yajur Veda and is described in detail in both the Rig Veda and the Shatapata Brahmana. The Brahmana with a hundred paths is the literal meaning. The name of a well-known Brahmana attached to the Vajasanei Sanghita. Sanghita means a compilation or the white Yajur Veda, Shukla Yajur Veda. Like the Sanghita, this Brahmana is ascribed to the Rishi Yajnavalkya. It is perhaps the most modern of the Brahmanas and is preserved in two shakas or schools, the Madhyamdina and the Kanva. The version belonging to the former is well known and it is divided into 14 khandas or books which contain the 100 adhyayas or lectures. The whole work is regarded as the most systematic and interesting of all the Brahmanas, and though intended mainly for ritual and sacrificial purposes, is full of curious mythological details and legend. The Ashvamedha ritual involves the sacrifice of a consecrated horse that is allowed to wander freely for a year under the protection of the king's army. The lands where the horse roamed without challenge were considered under the dominion of the king performing the sacrifice. If the horse was captured or challenged, it could result in conflict. The Ashvamedha was seen as the ultimate symbol of royal power and cosmic order. By conducting the Ashvamedha, the king aimed to attain universal sovereignty, Sarvabhoma, ensuring the prosperity of his kingdom and demonstrating his piety. It also held a spiritual aspect, symbolizing the release of the soul from the material world, aligning with the broader cosmological and sacrificial symbolism found in Vedic rituals. So to put this in more direct terms, when a king wanted to establish his sovereignty over a wide area, uh, not just a king, but an emperor, really, someone with a, a huge span of territory under his control. He would perform the Ashvamedha. And this sacrifice is extremely complex and lengthy and required the use or giving away of vast quantities of wealth, not only into the sacrificial fire, but also to the people who attended this, and this was open to the public, the citizens of the kingdom. And they would come, literally uh, live in the camp of the sacrifice for at least a month while all the rituals are performed. After the horse had roamed for a year without any opposition, and the idea is that the horse would roam freely through the kingdoms of the subsidiary kings and that by granting it free passage, they would 
symbolized their submission to the emperor. So historically, this is well known in the Mahabharata, performed by King Yudhishthir after the Battle of Kurukshetra, and in the Ramayana, performed by King Rama. So this sacrifice is also closely linked with the Rajasuya. Now, the historical documents I've been able to find mention that the Ashvamedha symbolizes the external sovereignty of the king over a large territory. And the Rajasuya symbolizes the internal sovereignty over his home territory. And so both these sacrifices are often found together. They are in the two instances I mentioned. So when King Yudhishthir, for example, had conquered the Kurus and was the undisputed emperor of Hastinapur, which is now modern Delhi in India, he performed this sacrifice along with his brothers under the guidance of the sage Vyasadeva, who was in the family lineage. So he was accompanied by Krishna and many, many sages, even from other planets. Well, this is a, an amazing story. And the, the same is true of Rama's performance of the sacrifice. So the significant thing, in my mind, the most significant thing about this ritual is its result. One who performs the Ashvamedha successfully, without any opposition from opposing kings and so on, becomes identical with Hiranyagarbha. Hiranyagarbha, if you remember back from our discussion in the Katopanishad series, is the personification or the state of being of Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, and represents the sum total of all the egos, the false ego in the whole universe. So this is the highest position that one can obtain within samsara. That last is very important because this is not liberation. It is, in fact, an identity with the mode of passion. After all, a king has to be grounded in the mode of passion to be an effective king. He has to be able to fight and win against opposing armies. So he has to have lots of energy. More, after establishing himself as the emperor, he has to maintain his position, which of course requires constant effort. So in this world, I mean, in, in this Kali Yuga, nobody can attain this kind of status. There's too much conflict, too much disagreement, too much disorder in the world for any one ruler to take control of the entire planet. But in previous ages, it was possible because Vedic culture was spread all over the world. In modern times, the archaeologists are surprised to find evidence of Vedic culture in South America, and now beginning even in North America, and what to speak of all over Europe and Africa. There are many, many artifacts and, you know, cave drawings and whatnot that show links with the Vedic culture. And this is also described in the Vedas themselves, that the Vedic civilization was global, worldwide, so this is the empire to which the performer of the Ashvamedha aspired. And importantly, after death, he aspired to attain the status of Brahma, Hiranyagarbha, who is considered a direct uh, outgrowth or son of Brahman. This is the highest status that one can attain by transmigration of the soul as an individual living entity. What is the point here? If no one can 
actually perform this sacrifice in Kali Yuga? Well, there is something called Manasa Puja. Manasa Puja means performing a ritual in the mind, mentally, by meditation, and that one gets the same result as performing the ritual physically by performing it with the imagination. So there's so many stories about this. For example, in the Shiva Purana, there was one young boy growing up in a small village, and there was some problem, I forget the details, but there was a problem in his village. I think there was a, maybe a, a famine or a lack of food. He asked his mother, who happened to be very wise, how can we get over this tremendous problem? And she said, well, the sages say that one who performs the exalted worship of Shiva, as described in the scriptures, can get this result, this prosperity or this safety that comes from the performance of elaborate puja. But we have no such facility because we are poverty stricken. We are in trouble. We're all starving. And of course, the boy, as, as a young boy, didn't have any resources. But he had a strong desire to perform a wonderful ritual for Shiva. So what did he do? He read in the scriptures, or he heard in a recitation of some scripture at a temple, that one can perform Manasa Puja and get the same result as the physical exercise, the sacrifice. So he determined to do this. And with his mother's permission, he went to the bank of the river, made a small Shiva Lingam out of ordinary clay, and sat down, went into meditation, and performed all the elaborate worship described in the scriptures. And if you remember back in the Shiva Purana series, we went over this, and it's, I mean, astonishing. <laughs> it would require the resources of an entire kingdom, a very wealthy kingdom at that, to perform these rituals. And what happened? Shiva was pleased and gave him darshan. And then subsequently, all the problems of the village and the surrounding area were solved. So, in the same way, one who performs the Ashvamedha Jagna is able to solve the greatest problem in life, which is the fear of rebirth in the ordinary human form. He becomes a resident of Brahmaloka and at the end of the universe goes back to Brahman. This is the benefit of performing the Ashvamedha Jagna. So, if one performs this Jagna by meditation, one gets the same result. And that is the topic of the very first chapter of Brihar Aranyakopanishad. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.